Voices, an open door book of stories, is the latest in a long series of texts, 54 of them in total, novellas, collections of poetry, and Irish translations, amongst others, put together by the author Patricia Scanlon. To join me now to talk about the very latest in the series is Helen Ryan, who's the Policy Officer for the National Adult Literacy Agency. Helen, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about, first of all, what you do there. Well, I'm from NALA, and it's lovely to be here, Rick. Um, NALA is the National Adult Literacy Agency, as you said, and we are uh, actually 40 years old this year. We began in 1980 with a group of uh, volunteers and trying to help adults who were struggling with reading. Uh, and we've been working in the area for all of those years and delighted that this particular um, book has come, I suppose, at this time now, after working with Patricia since 1998 uh, doing this. A lot of our work is around supporting adults around the country. So uh, there are one in six adults who would struggle with reading and understanding information. So that's actually trying to be fluent readers, if you like. Uh, and we would work with uh, them. They would ring us up. You might have seen some of our ads. Uh, RTE has been very good to us on post. We have lots of people who will put ads out for us. And we will uh, ask people to ring us in, chat to them about what they might want to do, and then refer them out to the local services where uh, they may go back and return to learning. And then we also support tutors as well, which is another element to having a great resource like this available um, to work with the learners. Maybe just before we talk about this, explain to me, because I've read some of the stats that are, that are in this book, you've said yourself there about the number of adults who maybe might only functionally, they would have problems with things like timetables or reading things that are, that are extremely yeah. simple. But then there's a whole other cohort of adults who can read, but then potentially don't read fiction at all because they find that something that's quite hard to do. And that's one of the reasons this project came about. Maybe tell us a little bit about those people. Yeah, so when you're learning to read, as we all remember um, back, or if you're working with, with um, young people now, you begin by reading little bits of words and trying to, but putting them all together and getting that fluency can be a struggle for some adults. And when you don't do it very well, you sometimes think, I'm not going to go near there. So I'd never think of picking up. Lots of adults will say things like, I could never read a book because they fear of the size of a book like that and how, what it's going to take out of me to read and remember the words as I go by. So it's really important that there is material like this for people. So a lot of what was happening years ago, now back when it began in the late 90s, um, where it all started was for Patricia in particular, there were people coming into the library where she worked who said things like, are there any books for me to read? And there weren't any books. And you're not going to hand an adult a, child, a book for a child. That's very um, insulting in one sense and also stigmatising. So there was a need for that type of uh, story written for emerging readers. So readers that are maybe not have moved on to a full length novel where there might be very long sentences of literary nature. So it was trying to find a story that was easy enough to, to read in amid a thousand words, uh, written in a way that was easily digestible, but was good and interesting. Maybe tell me the story about this series and how it comes about from Patricia's point of view, because you're right, Patricia is just working in a library at this point. She's not Patricia Scanlon. Yes, so Patricia was a librarian for many years and would have sort of worked with um, both tutors coming in from the literacy service, she was uh, aware of them, and she'd hear from adults themselves saying, any books in, nothing for me to read and whatever. And she just got this idea, her first novel um, had come out, she got some literacy tutor, I think, joked to her and actually said, Patricia, would you ever think of writing a story for um, some of our emerging readers in the literacy service? And she thought about that for a minute and she talked to a few people and she went and wrote that book, Second Chance, and I think it was published around the mid-90s. And the feedback from that was really positive. People were like, my God, there's a piece of writing written for me as an adult that I could follow and it was interesting and engaging. And from that success, really, she approached New Island and Edwin was the gentleman uh, there. We had worked with Edwin as well back uh, then. He approached ourselves and this whole idea came uh, together around why don't we ask well-known Irish authors, would they write novella, not a too long, um, you know, you're talking 15,000 words, 10, 15,000 words, books, we'll publish them and we'll see is this what 
sort of Irish uh, people want to read because they are very accessible. The, that's the really great thing about the novellas. They're very accessible to everyone. But in particular, they support emerging readers who uh, want to read something that is interesting but not too complex. And people did want to read them. And over the course of years, you've found yeah. some of the most high profile authors in Ireland have contributed to the series. This is slightly different in that it's a collection of short stories. Yeah. So tell me about this collection and maybe tell me about some of the people who've, who've, who've become involved in this one. Yes, so this time um, when we spoke, actually spoke to New Island at the time around, uh, people were saying they'd love new, new stories. And when we had a chat with them, they'd actually talk to Patricia about what they might do. And they came up with this idea of maybe short stories. And Patricia would have contacted all of the authors, uh, explained what we were trying to do and get a collection. And some fabulous people said, yes, I'd be happy to write a story for you. About a thousand words, um, short enough, um, you know, concepts and, and, and sentences. Let's look at, can you keep it simple enough? But again, it did come to Patricia and she edited them and we looked at them. Uh, if there was any issues, we would have gone back to the authors. But in the main, they were brilliantly put together um, with great ideas, characters, and some of the stories in it. With some great names. I mean, we have people uh, like Roddy Doyle, we have uh, Carlo Gebler, we have Sinead Moriarty, Sheila Flanagan, tons of names in there and some new and emerging Irish writers that I was surprised, delighted to see some great new names in there as well. Tell me how the process works though, because from having read the stories in, in this collection, I am not exactly sure as to how they differ from short stories in other collections. It's not immediately obvious, obviously, from reading some of these stories. So you said Patricia takes the editing eye and puts it to that. And then there's the kind of plain English look that, mm. that goes over. How does that work? What's that about? Yeah, well, I suppose first I think the authors, maybe when they got the brief, probably in their mind had a good sense of what they were mapping out. So when Patricia got them then and looked at some, some sentences if they were too long, for example. So our, our attention span and if there's, you know, a sentence is six lines long, it's too long. I've forgotten what's at the beginning by the end. So we would have looked at shortening stuff up. Language can be challenging sometimes. So we might have looked a little bit of where there was some language that uh, we needed to suggest other, other words or other changes. Um, using perhaps contractions were in there, the, you know, I, I, I didn't, so I do not. So we, we just, we, we would have read them sort of as readers of what's easier for somebody to be reading here. So light touches really around the plain English side and nothing changed. The, the thing about plain English is it doesn't change anything to do with what's being said. Uh, now there were a couple of words that we, we grappled with and I know in one story they actually define what, uh, what words mean, but th th plain English isn't about dumbing it down at all. So it was important to leave in some words. So for example, the very first story, Gurrier in the Desmond. I mean, I struggled even with pronouncing that. That's a cheese. Um, and he's, um, the blind boy has many other cheeses in a story, but it's a great um, word to, and, and leaving it in there for people. Let's look up these things if I don't understand them. Uh, and with reading the story, hopefully it, the, the meaning comes through. Now, Patricia Scanlon can't be with us uh, today for, for this event, but she has pointed out a section of her story, her wonderful story from this book, and you have very bravely agreed to read it for us. What's it going to be? Yes, uh, yes Patricia's story in uh, Voices is uh, a lovely story. It's called I Have a Voice, and uh, I'm going to read uh, about a page and a half. So Rudolph will be here in a few minutes. She inhaled deeply on her fag. She makes a face. They have all gone nervous in there. Ha ha, she hates our consultant. Rudolph is his nickname, the head of the department. He runs his kingdom with the will of iron. If we do not bow, submit and agree that he knows best, then we are mad, depressed or deranged. Rudolph, so called because his remarkably shiny red nose is a podgy, flabby man. He is the face of a drinker, red veined, florid, his mean little eyes stare at you from under heavy lids. The care attendant pops his head out the door. You are first on the list today, Martha. Best get in and not keep Dr. M waiting. The staff call him Dr. M. He's not even a Mr. or a Professor, Martha told me. A little fat failure, she said bitterly. And he takes it out on us. Shrinks. They are a law unto themselves. They can say we are cuckoo and no one can argue. Martha stubs out her cigarette. I follow her in. Rudolph is making his entrance. The doors of the ward are flung open. He marches along importantly. Nurses flocking after him. He is followed by his house doctor, a skinny chap with pimply skin. That young fellow is only out in nappies. Tiny Sir Echo Martha sneers. 
I laugh in spite of myself. My tummy is in knots. I have to face the team and argue my case. I want to see a medical doctor. I want to have tests done to find the cause of my pain. I sit at the table across from Rudolph and his minions. I need medical attention, as well as... We've discussed this many times. He rolls his eyes. Your GP has had tests done. Nothing was found. There is nothing physically wrong with you. I am not imagining my pain, I shout. I stand up and wallop the table. I kick my chair away. You are not listening. I roar. Increase her sedation, I hear him say as I run from the room. We must play the game to get out of here, Sarah, my roommate, says the next day. She is coming down from a manic episode. Yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, she declares. I am too drugged to talk. I groan in pain. I am ovulating. The pain is always worse then. I want to vomit. It is always this way. They have you on more drugs, the new art teacher says when we meet again. Yes, I mutter. Why? I tell her the whole story of all the years of pain and sickness, of being told it is all in my head. I bet you have, she said a long word, endometriosis. I have the same thing. I've had it since I was a teenager. It took ages to diagnose. I have a great consultant, you must go to her. What? Am I hearing right or is it the drugs? Listen, when you get out of here, get your GP to send you to this lady. She writes down a name on a drawing pad. She folds it up and gives it to me. She tells me her story, the same as mine, but her doctor did not give up on her. I will play the game, I decide. Yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. How are you today, Rudolph asks. His bored, brown-eyed gaze sweeps over me. Much better, I say. I even manage a smile. Excellent. The nurses tell me you are more responsive. Yes, I murmur. I play the game for two more months before Rudolph decides that I can leave the mausoleum. My sister collects me. I am free. It's like you've been reading those all your life to <laughs> rooms full of people. Uh, just maybe briefly before we finish, tell us um, one of the reasons that we're not in front of a room full of people or not in a, an actual physical festival is because of what's been going on over the space of the last six, seven, eight, nine months. Tell us what that's been like for the National Adult Literacy Agency. Yeah, it has been very difficult for, not ourselves, but for many of the students uh, that we work with and, and are out there. In particular, I suppose, when you think of all the information and messaging we've all had to take in. So from the COVID leaflet, our lovely colour that we associate with it now, yellow that came in the door, uh, right through to people perhaps filling in um, unemployment pandemic forms to perhaps if you have children having to help them with their homework. We have been um, fielding calls from learners all over the country on those issues. So our free phone line has been open. We're all working from home in the main and talking to people when they ring us around uh, understanding some of the health messaging that the government, you know, quite clearly put to us, but it's challenging enough to try and understand everything. And then supporting adults in particular where they were trying to access services. The online and digital issue is huge for many people. So we've had many uh, adults ring us with things like, I have a smartphone here and I'd love to talk to my grandkids or my kids. Can you help me? And literally talking through with people how they can use some of this technology that is out there. Uh, so we are hopeful we, you know, we're moving into, we're in this sort of autumn winter period now um, that we can keep, you know, the spirits up for people because not every local class is starting back. But thankfully, all the libraries are, their doors are certainly open for click and collect and some of the doors are open for people to go in. So bit by bit, our, the services and the library services are there. And I think that's really positive just to keep all our spirits up. And reading is a really, reading can just transport people away so we in the latest campaign we've been saying to people ring us if you'd like to look at reading uh, for pleasure sounds like a brilliant idea to me helen ryan the policy officer for the national adult literacy agency thanks for joining us joining me now is one of the authors featured in the anthology carlo gebler thank you for being here hello tell us maybe a little bit about your involvement in this and how it came about oh well like all things nowadays it came about because of an email and I think, I suspect, Patricia Scanlon must have been talking to people at New Island, and they suggested that I, I had I'd written a book called The Wing Orderly's Tales, 
which is 12, I think, stories, demotic, violent, disturbing, filthy, about a wing orderly in a prison serving a long sentence for violence. And the wing orderly is the person who cleans the toilets, hands out the welcome pack, uh, which prisoners receive. This is a prison in Northern Ireland. I'm sure that's the same here. But he also has access to the officer's pod. And so he's able to listen to the gossip. He's able to see the day book. He's across everything. And I wrote these stories called The Wing Orderly's Tales. And one of them, Mariel at New Island thought, suggested brilliantly to Patricia Scanlon, might be, once revised, suitable for this collection. And tell me about the nature of that revision process. Is that something that, that, that <laughs> comes through you, or is that something that happens elsewhere? <laughs> OK. Um, my reason for wanting to be involved in a project like this is 29 years and counting, maybe 30, of uh, work as a prison teacher. One of the things you discover when you go to prison is that a very large number of people who are in prison either cannot read or write at all or are simply functionally literate. They can write their name, they can recognize the word Dublin because of the shape or the word Belfast, but they are not able to deal with complex texts. One of the things, I've, I learned many things in prison, it was my university, it taught me more than anything else that I've done in my life. And one of the things that I learned in prison was the primacy, the supremacy of narrative. When you're in prison, the ability to tell a story is extremely important. And that was what started this book, The Wing Orderly's Tales. The Wing Orderly's Tales is Chalky, the orderly, talking, telling you 12 things that he knows about that have happened whilst he was the wing orderly. All of them are terrible. They're about stabbings and feuds and all sorts of things, the sorts of things that go on in prisons. And I wrote it very much, The Wing Orderly's Tales, for a readership in a prison. I made the story simple and pure, in my opinion, and fluent and visceral and accurate. The story that they thought that would be suitable for this collection, Cell 13, was two and a half thousand words, so it was too long, A. And B, what I understood was, even though I thought it had been written in a um, unpretentious and accessible way, I was wrong. And so I had to comb it through and reduce it from two and a half or maybe even 2,700 words. Well, I was meant to get it to 1,000. I got it to 1,054. And that involved taking out absolutely everything except for the, the kernel, the, not the K-E-R-N-E-L of the story. And that was an interesting process. Was it a tough process? It was, yes, it's a tough process because what happens, even if you think you're right, even if you set out to write in, the, in an accessible way, as opposed to um, an inaccessible or truculent way, you will nonetheless have um, flow. Think of it like a line of dominoes, your language. So one word, is a domino, knocks another word, is a domino, knocks a third. You've let, laid out dominoes as a child on the linoleum on Sunday afternoon, I'm sure. <sighs> so even a simple story will have that inherent deep structure. When you reduce it from two and a half to seven or to 2,700 words to 1,000, you interfere with, you violate that deep structure. So you have to... Um, <laughs> in simple Simon terms, you have to remove two-thirds of the dominoes, but ensure that one will knock the next, will knock the next, will knock the next, and that you will have the forward movement. And that takes time. 
The final product is fantastic, though. Maybe you read a little something from cell 13. I will. Just a few paragraphs. I'm going to read a section from the middle. The conceit is, Jorky, the wing orderly, like everyone in prison, is endlessly on the make. He's always trying to acquire tobacco, phone cards, hooch, information. And one of the other prisoners on his landing says that he thinks his cell is haunted. And we know it's a cell where someone has committed suicide from an, early an earlier story. And so Chalky has a brilliant idea, because he's the orderly, of saying, well, we can swap cells, and you give me some phone cards, and you give me some tobacco, and blah, 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 blah. But you can't change a cell if you're a prisoner because you have wished it. It has to be okayed by the officers. So the first part of the story deals with that. Chalky's the wing orderly, so if he wants to move cells, they make it happen. I turned in at 11 and fell asleep. I awoke a few hours later. There was a sound, watery and scratchy. I raised my head. The cell light was off, but the security lights outside shone through the bars. I saw the outlines of my table, television, cell door, hand basin, and the partition that screens the toilet. I needed light, but the switch at the door was too far away. Then I had a brainwave. I slipped the remote from its place under my pillow and pressed on and jumped up. The set came on, and by the light from the screen, I saw slithering over the toilet rim, having swum up the U-bend, a rat. Christ! The rat sprang to the floor and ran under the table on which the TV sat. Jesus! From the bed, I wasn't getting down, I leaned across to the control panel by the cell door and hit the light and the alarm. I heard the bell ringing faintly in the officer's pod. I banged on the cell door. There's a rat in my cell, I shouted. And if people want to know what happens next, they're going to have to read the anthology. Um, perhaps just before we finish, normally you and I would be doing this in a room full of people at a festival as opposed to here and being recorded with cameras. Has this been a, a strange time over the last few months for you as a writer? My children say I've always been self-isolating, that I'm made for COVID, or COVID is made for me. I have not been anywhere. I live in Enniskillen. I have been into a restaurant in Enniskillen. I have been to Tesco's in Enniskillen, but I have not been anywhere since March the 17th or March the 18th until today. You are the first human being, not in my world, that I've seen since this strange pandemic started. I have used the time to read a lot of books that I felt it was necessary to read. So I've read Crime and Punishment and Tristram Shandy and the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas and Lolita. These are all books I should have read and I knew, but, you know, I hadn't ticked off. Now I'm working my way through Boswell's Life of Johnson, which, as you know, is like a thousand pages. I have also used my time. I've been doing a lot of teaching. Zoom was the aid there, the equivalent of Hermes. But I've written a book. I've written an entire book, 28 Tales from Boccaccio's Decameron. Boccaccio's Decameron is a book about 10 people hiding from the plague in Florence out in the countryside who tell stories to each other to repair their ravaged psyches. 
So I've extracted 28 out of the total of 100 stories from the Decameron or that are in the Decameron and written them in an accessible, modern, fluent way, but I've, I've retained the wimples and, um, you know, the swords. So it's, it's still high medieval, but I hope accessibly high medieval. It is good to hear that you're one of the authors that's managed to use this time constructively as opposed to a few others I've spoken to. But Carla Gebler, thanks for joining us. It was my pleasure. May the gods smile. This childhood memory is so slight that I ask myself why I recall it so well. I think it is because it was the moment when I sensed that one day I would become a writer. However, I was too young back then to understand what I was feeling. But I remember the day so clearly. I can still smell the floor polish and the shining lino. I can still feel the grains of sand stuck between my bare toes when I crossed the big bedroom. I can still feel warm summer air coming in the open window. I am upstairs in Mrs. Butler's guest house, a mile outside Court Town in Wexford. It is my family's summer holiday in 1969. Flies swarm under trees near the house. Crickets chirp from the long grass. Age 10, I sit alone on one of three beds in a large back bedroom. Here at night, my parents sleep in one bed and my sister in another. My older brother and I share the third bed. My father is a sailor. He only enjoys nights at home with his family in Fingness if his ship is loading in Dublin Port. This is what makes summer holidays so special. We are all together. The summer of 1969 is not our first holiday at Mrs Butler's, but it will be our last. Some months later, days before Christmas, my mother dies. Childhood changes for me forever. But as a child, sitting alone upstairs in that guest house, there is no hint of sorrow to come. Mrs. Butler's house feels huge. The steps to her kitchen are out of bounds. Other families also stay there. A cock family seem posh because they have a car parked on the gravel. The boy whose father owns the car dances to a song, Viva Bobby Jones playing on the radio. At night, other music fills the night air in court town. At dusk in the swelling lights of a fairground, a song by the speakers blares from loudspeakers. It is called, The Carnival is Over. For years afterwards, I cannot listen to it. It brings back too many memories. The funfair smells of chips and hot dogs. Children run in the shadows, faces covered in candy floss. I walk among boots where men try to win prizes. Teenage girls whirl overhead, screaming in the swing chairs that spin around. Mrs. Butler is kindly, but I'm slightly scared of her. Mary, her gentle, elderly helper, carries jugs of milk from a nearby farm. The boy from Cork goes to play pitch and putt with his father. I tag along excitedly. On the first tee, his father asks me, I wish to hit one shot. Golf is new to me. I raise the club, nervous and excited. A man comes running. He shouts that I have not paid. My club stops inches from the ball. I am afraid to hit it. The cock father does not offer to pay for me. My fingers long to have just once struck a golf ball. Beside Mrs. Butler's house is a field with a pond. I play alone there. Loud crickets sing everywhere. I cannot spy them despite spending hours searching. A donkey watches me with patient eyes. Flies buzz around his face. My brother and the cock by kick football on the gravel. Local children stand at Mrs. Butler's gate to watch them like they are film stars. My mother comes to the front door. She calls us in for dinner. There are desserts I am afraid to taste. They look like the frog spawn in the pond. The adults at the table talk about gangs of hell's angels seen in nearby seaside towns. A mile away in the dusk, cut down throbs with the sins I have yet to discover. After my mother dies, there are no more family holidays. A quarter 
century passes before I visit Court Town again. By then, I am a father myself. Driving my young sons to Hotel and Rosler, I decide to show them Mrs. Butler's. As a child, I was here so often that I should be able to find it. But I spend an hour circling small roads. I pass a house three times before I realize I am back again as an adult outside it. Standing at the rusting padlock gate, I need to ask the man next door if this is the right house. It looks so tiny, closed down and empty. Mrs. Butler is long dead. I cannot believe this is the same garden where I played. The room where we ate our meals looks so small. I look down the road. In my mind's eye, I can see the stooped figure of Mary carrying milk. I can see my family leave this house, setting off for another day on Courtown Beach. I remember us waiting for that magic moment of catching our first glimpse of the sea. I can see us walking home from the funfair at night. The road is so small that my car blocks it. I do not climb the wall to peer into the empty rooms. Instead, I close my eyes. In my mind, I walk again up those stairs with the long week stretching ahead. I remember that moment when my family went downstairs and left me alone. Later, I will understand the feelings that came over me as I sat there. I will recognize it as the moment when poems enter my head. But at 10 years old, I am just puzzled by this feeling of wanting to stop time, to remember everything about that moment, the summer air blowing through the window, the drone of crickets, the sand between my toes. I remember sitting there, tired and happy. I remember pressing my forehead against the window. I know I will never forget that room. Then I hear my brother call me from the stairs. I turn and run happily down to my family. None of us know what joys and sorrows are to come. I had a dream about you last night. At the sound of Juliet's voice, Sarah's shoulders tightened with tension. You had a dream about me, Aunt Juliet? Joe asked. He was eating cereal. He put down his spoon. What dream? I dreamed of a snow wolf. Juliet leaned closer to the little boy. Her voice dropped low. The snow wolf was running and leaping through deep white snow, glad to be alive. Where was I? Joe asked. You were the snow wolf. So now I know. A snow wolf is your spirit animal. And Joe, it is an incredibly powerful spirit animal. It means you have an appetite for freedom. Sarah wished there was a polite way to tell someone who sat in your kitchen and lived in your house to shut up. Not someone though, Juliet. Juliet was her husband Richard's younger sister. She had dark purple hair and the word fearless tattooed on the inside of her arm. Juliet had come to live with them six months ago after yet another failed relationship. What is a spirit animal, Joe asked. Sarah closed the lunchbox with a snap. Joe, finish your breakfast. You need to hurry for school, she said. Your spirit animal is the shape of your soul, Juliet said. It is your guide and helper in this world, but also in the other world. Joe, come on. Sarah felt irritated by Juliet's silly talk, so her voice was snappish. Joe looked up at her too fast and said, what's wrong? Nothing, Sarah said. Nothing's wrong, but we're going to be late. Okay, Joe said. What is your spirit animal? He asked Juliet. A black panther, Juliet said. Of course it is, muttered Sarah to herself. No way was it going to be a mouse or a sparrow. She went upstairs. Richard was tying his tie. She's supposed to be looking for a job, Sarah said. But all she ever does is meditate and cook horrible desserts made with coconut sugar. I know, he said, I buy the ingredients. They cost a fortune. So stop buying them. She can buy her own. We're not making her pay rent because she's your sister and you feel sorry for her. Sarah, she can't afford to. You know she can't, Richard said. But it's been months. She doesn't show signs of ever leaving. Give her time. She's so good with Joe. He loves having her here. She fills his head with nonsense, Sarah said. She talks to him about his aura, the healing power of the mind, 
how he can do anything if he visualizes it. But he likes it. Maybe, but it's not good for him. He should be outside playing with other children, not in with her, painting pictures of his aura. Back downstairs, Sarah picked up Joe's coat. We're off, she called from the front door. She wondered would Juliet clear away the breakfast things or leave them there for Sarah to do when she got back from work. In the car on the way to school, Sarah tried to prepare Joe for the day ahead. This was what his teacher, Miss Ryan, had suggested she do at their last meeting. She said it would help Joe to settle. You have your hurl and helmet, Sarah said. It's hurling practice today. Yes. And you're reading in the morning before little break. Okay. The way he didn't complain hurt Sarah more than if he had protested. She felt she was driving a small, scared prisoner who had learned not to thrash or fuss. Every day when she arrived at pickup time, he was waiting for her, his bag on his shoulders. Around him, other children played, not Joe. Let's go, he always said as soon as he saw her. Juliet says my spirit animal is a snow wolf, Joe said now proudly, and hers is a black panther. What's yours? I have no idea, Sarah said. I don't really believe in that stuff. But if it is real, he persisted, what would you be? I don't know, maybe a chicken? You wouldn't be a chicken, he said, offended on her behalf. Maybe Juliet knows what you are. It's just stories, she said. Juliet doesn't know. At the gate, she kissed him goodbye. I love you, darling. See you later. Have a good day. See you later. He never said he loved her at the drop-offs. Sarah watched him walk across the playground alone. She wanted to run after him, grab the bag from his back and say, not today, let's go somewhere else, just us. She wanted to hold him tight, to be the person who protected him, not the person who dropped him every morning to a school he hated. How much longer would they give it, she wondered as she drove on to work. Another month, a year, and then what? He'll settle, Richard had said after the first meeting with Joe's teacher, Miss Ryan, a few months into junior infants. That was when Miss Ryan said they should have Joe assessed in case he had additional needs. He just needs time, Richard had said. He's young for his age. Sarah had agreed. He is nearly the youngest in the class. But she knew that it was not just his youth that set Joe apart. It was something else, something that was in him, that made the other children want to hurt him, not help him. Let's go, Joe said, as soon as he saw Sarah that afternoon. But before they could leave, Miss Ryan came over to them. Can I speak to you, she asked. She put a hand on Sarah's arm to stop her from leaving. Yes, of course, Sarah said. Her heart sank. Joe, wait here for me. The classroom smelled of chalk and feet and disinfectant. There was an incident during hurling practice, Miss Ryan said. Joe hit another boy with his hurl. I see. Sarah waited. Experience had taught her that it was better to wait. I did not see how it began, Miss Ryan continued. She was speaking quickly. Joe said that the other boy started the fight, but I asked the other children, and they said that the other boy did not do anything physical. No, Sarah thought, he wouldn't have to. Not at this stage. The groundwork had been so well laid by months of teasing. Joe would not hit anyone without good reason, Sarah said. Even then, he would have to be provoked a lot. I'm sure that is true, Miss Ryan said, but at this school, we have a policy of no tolerance for hitting. Of course you do, thought Sarah. You have a policy for anything easy, but where is your policy for protecting a child who finds every day in your care confusing and lonely and now dangerous? I was wondering, Miss Ryan continued, if you have thought any more about an assessment. Her voice was full of concern, but Sarah did not believe in her concern. We have not, Sarah said. Perhaps you should, Miss Ryan said. Sarah knew that Miss Ryan wanted an answer that would make her own life easier. A piece of paper with a label that would tell her what to do with Joe. We will consider it, Sarah said. And they would have to, she knew even though she did not believe that giving Miss Ryan the label she was looking for would make her a better teacher to Sarah's son. 
Outside, Sarah took Joe's hand on the way to the car. The playground was empty, so he let her. She wondered would he ask what Miss Ryan had wanted. He did not. He stared out the window and said nothing until they reached the house. What day is it today? He asked then. Tuesday, Sarah said. Why? He did not answer, but she knew he was calculating in his head. If today is Tuesday, then tomorrow is Wednesday, then it's Thursday and then Friday, and then the weekend. Her heart ached at how much she wished the weeks away. They went into the kitchen where Juliet was baking. She had cleared the breakfast bowls, but there was cocoa powder on the pale wooden countertops and some of those dried red berries that she ate that stuck to her teeth. I'm making chia seed brownies, she said to both of them. Do you want to help? She asked Joe. Yes, please, he said. Can I stir the bowl? She pulled a stool out for him and lifted him onto it. Of course you can. It's hard work because of the chia seeds, but they have loads of protein to make you strong. Sarah watched them. Joe's head was bent over the bowl and he stirred the thick mixture with a wooden spoon. The mixture looked disgusting, Sarah thought. Juliet put her hand over Joe's to help him. That is very good, Joe, Juliet said. And Sarah, just as she had known that the concern in Miss Ryan's voice was fake, heard that the love in Juliet's voice was real. Juliet, tell me more about Joe's spirit animal, Sarah said. A snow wolf? What does that mean? It's a really powerful sign, Juliet said. Joe stopped stirring and turned his head to look at Juliet. Go on, said Sarah, pulling out a stool. Tell me all about it.